If you love your children, if you love your country, if you love the God of love, Make sure that you have slaves of all races, ethnicities, and genders, all in proportion to their numbers in the general population. Richard Allen, abolitionist, freed slave, and founder of the first black American church, if he had been a modern-day liberal anti-racist activist. Hello, fellow kids, and welcome back to What is Politics? Today, I want to do a little old-school OG what is politics and talk about how political words, words with no consensus definitions, make us all stupid and easy to manipulate. And a recent example of this is the word equity, which has almost entirely replaced the word equality in academia and NGOs and activist organizations, as well as in corporate HR departments. And in this episode, I'm going to argue that replacing the word equality with a much more vague concept of equity is largely a way of taking ideas that promote economic inequality and disguising them in the language and style of social justice. And that it's also a way of keeping people of all races and genders and ethnicities divided in conflict and competition with one another, so that we can't pose an effective challenge to the people in power. In other words, replacing the word equality with equity is right-wing politics disguised as left-wing politics. And what I want to do with this episode is to give you those they-live glasses so that you can see who's really interested in social justice and who's just using it as an excuse for other ulterior motives. And I also want you to realize that if you see yourself as being on the political right, that you probably have a lot of ideas that are actually on the political left. And if you see yourself as being on the political left, that you might actually be a right-wing psycho. Since before the political left had a name, it had always been preoccupied with notions of equality. In fact, that's literally the defining characteristic of the left, from the emergence of the terms left and right in the wake of the French Revolution, up until the Cold War. The term left in politics represented those who strove for more equality, and the term right referred to those who believed in maintaining or expanding hierarchy. And since we're talking about politics, which is all about decision-making in groups, when we're talking about left and right, what we're talking about is hierarchy versus equality of decision-making power. In other words, democracy on the left, where people in a group have an equal say in the decisions that affect the group, whether that group is the citizens of your state or the workers in your workplace, versus autocracy on the right, where decision-making power comes from the top down according to rank. King over nobility over serfs, general over captain over private, boss over worker. The left in the French Revolution of 1789 supported democracy and the abolition of special ranks, and the right supported the monarchy and the preservation of special privileges and ranks for the nobility and the clergy. And the slogan of the left in the French Revolution was Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité, Liberty, Equality, and Brotherhood, a slogan which was inspired in part by the writings of the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Today, people often think that liberty and equality are antithetical, that they're trade-offs, opposites. The more you have of one, the less you have of the other. But that's a legacy of the Cold War. Before that, those concepts were seen as a package that can only come together. A few decades before the French Revolution, Rousseau had pointed out that you can't have liberty without equality. Liberty means being free to act without someone dominating you. And political equality means there are no ranks. Everyone makes the decisions alone when those decisions affect you alone, and we make decisions together when those decisions affect us as a group, and we each have an equal voice in those group decisions. Political hierarchy, on the other hand, is ranked decision-making, where one person decides for the others without their consent or approval. One person bosses another around, and you have to obey, or else you face dire consequences. Master over slaves, captain over privates, owner over employees. If you disobey the owner, you get fired. Dire consequences. That is the opposite of liberty. You can only have liberty if you have political equality, equality of decision-making power. And Rousseau also noted that some degree of relative economic equality was necessary in order for liberty to exist. 
In Rousseau's words, if we care about liberty, then we should, quote, Make the wealth spread as small as you can. Don't allow rich men or beggars. No citizen should be so rich as to buy another, and none so poor that he is constrained to sell himself. Unquote. Because if people are buying and selling each other, or in our day, renting each other's labor, then you'll have one person bossing around another person all day. And that's the exact opposite of liberty and equality. And that's why the early socialist movement was in part preoccupied with abolishing the employer-employee relationship. It was seen as a relationship of domination and exploitation, on the same spectrum as slavery and serfdom, but adapted to the era of contracts and capitalism. So, until the rise of the Soviet Union and the supposedly communist states, freedom and political equality and economic equality were ideas that were inseparable on the left. And they still are today if the words right and left are to have any coherent meaning. Except for the most part, they don't, because no one knows what these terms mean anymore. After the Russian Revolution turned into an authoritarian political structure, the Soviet Union needed to keep on claiming to represent the global left in order to maintain its legitimacy even though it had in reality abandoned both political equality and liberty. And so, in order to justify its existence and to hold on to some pretense of socialism, the Communist Party in Russia had to shift the focus away from the ideas of equality of power and towards ideas of economic equality and equality between nations. And as we discussed a bit in the previous episodes, 20th century communism was basically an anti-colonial movement and industrialization movement before anything else. And because of this shift from liberty and political equality towards economic equality, the idea of what the left and right meant became confused. And the elites in the capitalist West, who were afraid of the appeal of socialism, were very happy to participate in this confusion. In particular, they loved the idea of liberty being completely divorced from equality. And in the new formulation, equality was depicted as the antithesis of liberty. So the elites of the U.S. and the USSR both sort of colluded to present us with this fake choice and this redefined fake political spectrum where you could supposedly have left-wing economic security imposed by an authoritarian state at the price of liberty and democracy, or you could have supposedly right-wing freedom in a democratic society but at the expense of economic equality and material security. And you can see the irony here that freedom and democracy, which were staples of the left since the beginning, since the French Revolution, that these somehow ended up in the right-wing camp in all of this garbledy gook. And this is the false choice that we're still presented with today. But even with these garbled definitions, for more than 200 years, the left was always associated with equality of one sort or another, at first with political and economic equality, and then later, after the rise of the communist states, with equality of wealth. But now, over the last 10 years or so, we've seen important institutions which are associated with the left in the popular imagination, like nonprofit NGOs and activist groups and universities. These institutions have been phasing out the use of the term equality entirely and replacing it with the word equity. Meanwhile, the corporate world, which has always been the enemy of the left and of any sort of equality, has also taken a very keen and sudden interest in equity particularly in their aptly named human resources departments, as if people are piles of coal to be shoveled into a giant demonic steam engine. Now, because of all this equity talk, which is always invoked in terms of concern for social justice, you have this weird political gobbledygook situation where big mega corporations like Amazon, which are everything the traditional left has always hated, that these big mega corporations are somehow being associated with the left. And this is a real gift to the right, to people who want more economic and political hierarchy. Because a lot of ordinary people hate those institutions. And they are very much right-wing institutions par excellence. Top-down, union-busting institutions where the boss tells the workers what to do and not the other way around and there's no democratic process going on. And this is true of all the big publicly traded corporations, whether we're talking about the Bible-quoting Chick-fil-A or rainbow flag-waving Starbucks. This nonsense has led to a situation where the terms left and right are now just completely meaningless. And this robs us of an extremely important tool that we need to be able to analyze who's on the side of equality of power and who's on the side of hierarchy of power. <laughs> 
And this, as we've seen in earlier episodes, has been one of the most important dividing lines in human politics since we emerged as a species. Most media pundits today and journalists today use the terms left and right just to mean woke and anti-woke. And these are camps which pretend to be or think that they are mortal enemies, but they're actually just two sides of the same coin. They both take legitimate ideas and concerns shared by many people, and then they turn them into idiotic nonsense, which divides people up against each other by various cultural categories in order to perpetuate economic inequality, thereby strengthening the powers that be. And I'll explain what I mean by this in a second. But for now, let's get back into equity versus equality on the supposed left. Wiener. Penis. PG. According to people who see themselves as concerned with social justice, equity is in and equality is out because equality is supposedly a failed and outdated ideal. So where outdated failed figures like Martin Luther King or Gandhi or the slavery abolitionists or the suffragettes talked about equality, all of the great political geniuses of today like Ibram X. Kendi, Kamala Harris, and Ronald McDonald, are talking about equity. And the reason that equality is supposed to be so passé is because equity is supposed to be so much more fair than equality. And that's literally what equity means, fairness. And the reason that equity is supposed to be so much fairer than equality is that equity supposedly focuses on the results of a policy, whereas equality supposedly focuses more on the process. And you have this famous meme that's used everywhere to illustrate this for a mass audience. And in this meme, you have three kids trying to watch a baseball game. And the kids are outside of the stadium behind a fence. And the kids are all black or brown, and there's this implication that they couldn't afford to buy the tickets. And the meme is two panels. And on the left panel, it says equality. And you see that each of the three kids is standing on an equal-sized crate to try to see the game over the fence. But the kids are all different heights. So the shortest kid can't see anything when he's standing on the crate. And then on the right caption, it says equity. And the tall kid has no crate, and the middle kid has one crate, and the short kid has two crates. And now their heads are all aligned at the same level, so they can all see the game equally, with equality. Which is funny, because equality is supposed to be a bad thing according to this stuff. But equality is actually what the equity side of the meme is showing. Just a different kind of equality than what's in the equity side of the meme. So, people who promote this concept of equity good, equality bad, will explain their position by pointing to the fact that black people in the United States got legal equality by the mid-1960s. But today, 60 years later, black Americans are still on the average poorer, they're in jail a lot more, they're underrepresented in fancy universities, they get arrested more, they get longer sentences when they're convicted for the same crimes with the same record as a white person. In other words, you still have a lot of inequality, and in particular, economic inequality. Again, equity seems to always be concerned about equality, just a specific kind of equality. And according to Ibram X. Kendi, the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, Equity is when the results of a policy are equal in terms of racial proportions. If 15% of the United States is black, then you have equity when 15% of the CEOs are black people, and when 15% of the kids that get into Harvard are black, and when 15% of the people in prison are black, and 15% of the homeless people are black. So that's fairness according to Kendi and the equity types, and that's the liberal institutional view of equality versus equity. Now on the conservative side of things, Conservatives tend not to like the words equality or equity, and people like Jordan Peterson make the exact opposite argument than the liberal equity types do. Peterson and others tell us that we should only care about the process being fair, not the results. What makes something fair is that the rules are fair, that the process is fair, and that the best person comes out on top. And race and gender are, or should be, irrelevant to this. Like if you're running in a race. The whole point of a race is to see who's the best. It defeats the entire purpose of a race to have everyone finish at the same time. And the most often invoked real-world applications of this are Ivy League admissions or corporate hiring, where equity is now a giant buzzword. And the idea is that so long as the rules for things like college admissions are fair, meaning that the same rules apply to everyone equally, then you're getting the best, most talented, hardworking, and qualified people to fill the leadership positions of tomorrow. And this benefits everyone. So in the conservative view, what makes something fair, i.e. equitable, is precisely the process and not the outcome. And conservatives like to talk about this in terms of equality of opportunity, which is the only kind of equality that they seem to be interested in. 
And equality of opportunity is an extremely misleading way of putting it. Because even if the process itself is perfectly fair, the reality is that working class and poor people and even many middle class people have so many obstacles to being able to even think of competing to get into these schools that it's more like equality of opportunity for rich people. And we'll look at some of the details of that in a bit. It's interesting to note, though, that the conservatives who are all against equity are invoking fairness, i.e. equity, when it comes to the process, while the people who are supposedly against equality and for equity are invoking equality of results as their definition of what equity is. And this mishkabibble is a big red flag, which tells us that these words are hiding what's actually going on underneath the surface. And what's actually going on underneath the surface is that we have two different methods for perpetuating economic inequality targeted at two different types of people. People with liberal dispositions and people with conservative dispositions. You have conservative messages which justify economic inequality by telling us that a fair process gives us fair results, while completely ignoring the fact that in a society like ours, the competition is rigged from the start in terms of who even gets a chance to compete at all. And on the other side, the liberal messages perpetuate inequality by pretending that what makes the world unfair is not economic inequality, but what makes the world unfair is having the wrong percentages of particular racial or gender groups at the top and bottom and middle of the economic inequality pyramid. And what is fair is a world with the same economic inequality and homelessness and skyrocketing rents and disappearing middle class that we have now, but where the proportion of colors and genders and religions among the people in the ruling class and in the homeless population and in all the ranks in between, when all their proportions are equal to their proportions in the population as a whole. It's basically rainbow lipstick on a capitalist pig. In other words, equity versus equality of opportunity isn't a right versus left argument. It's an argument between two types of right-wingers, liberal right-wingers versus conservative right-wingers who are basically arguing about how best to maintain the unfair and unequal hierarchies that we find in our society today. And both these arguments, but especially the liberal arguments, are what I like to call lizard people arguments. And by that I don't mean literal lizard people, but metaphorical lizard people. Persons of lizard. Like in those movies from the 1980s, V and They Live. Lizard people are people pretending to be advocating for equality of power, meaning left-wing ideas, the little guy, but they're actually advocating for ideas that promote dominance hierarchies, for the boss, for the state, the king, the landlord, the rich. They're trying to get you support things that you don't want by disguising them as things that you do want, like chocolate-covered cyanide pills, or like an authoritarian one-party state disguised as a worker control of industry, or like crusades and golden-crusted popes disguised as the teaching of Jesus. There's an age-old phenomenon that I like to call the class filter, or lizardification. Whenever you have ideas that are a threat to established power, things like socialism and Christianity, and the various movements for equality between various gender, ethnic, and racial groups of the 20th and 21st centuries, if these movements and ideas avoid getting crushed by the powers that be, they'll often end up getting absorbed and reinterpreted by the institutions of established power. And then they come out the other end as something completely different something that the elite classes are much more comfortable with. Christianity starts out as the religion of communal poverty, turn the other cheek and throw the moneylenders out of the temple, but then, as it gets adopted by the Roman elite, and eventually the Roman Emperor Constantine, and becomes the official religion of the empire, it turns into the religion of gold-encrusted popes and military conquests and crushing the serfs and crusades. Mid-19th century socialism was all about abolishing the employer-employee relationship and giving workers control over government and industry, and it was preoccupied with direct democracy. But then, as it passed through the parliaments of Europe and through the ruling bureaucratic elite of the Soviet Union and the other Marxist-Leninist states, it quickly morphed into a bunch of shameful excuses for state control over workers. And more recently, we have the civil rights and the black equality movements and women's liberation and gay liberation, trans rights. All these movements have had enormous successes in breaking down social hierarchies and making our society a much more equitable and human place to live than it had been before. But now, even those movements are starting to turn into methods of domination and control by various elites. And in every case, the shift can be hard to notice at first, because the elite-friendly versions are still disguised in the language and symbols of the original movements that threaten power. It's like how the socialist slogan, worker control of the means of production, 
originally meant literal worker control over their workplaces and over government, but once it got through the halls of power, it ended up meaning communist party control over the means of production and of the workers. Or how your non-binary intersectional feminist boyfriend is actually just a manipulative abuse artist who uses intersectional language and ideas so that he can better manipulate you. Now, the more recent movements for racial and gender equality. The ideas behind these movements very often came from ordinary people, from bottom-up social movements. And a lot of the queer and trans stuff in particular came from very poor, marginal people. But once they went through the Ivy League universities, which are full of rich kids and upper middle class professors, who have very different life experiences and concerns and interests than other people do, they started to get transformed into a very different set of ideas. Ideas that appeal to rich kids and upper middle class professors. So we see that the focus on economic inequality and class has been pushed more and more into the background and replaced with an emphasis on the types of preoccupations that rich people have microaggressions, and obstacles to becoming a corporate VP or CEO. Lean-in feminism. The original emphasis on solidarity and common humanity, which were central to all of these movements, turn into eternal divisions by race and gender and sexuality, which can never and must never be bridged. Ideas about giving more voice to people who aren't often heard get transformed into everyone has to always stay in their lane and know their place and everyone has to follow these rigid rules about what you can or can't say, or how you can dress, or what kind of music you can play, as determined by rich college kids. The idea of making spaces where everyone is comfortable turns into spaces where no one is comfortable. And when poor or working class people are discussed, they're often presented in the way that do-gooder rich people see them, as props to enhance the power of the do-gooder rich kids. The poor people are seen as helpless, innocent victims who need do-gooder rich people as allies and representatives to protect the total victim who is too feeble to be asked to do any of the emotional labor of articulating their own ideas or opinions. And these great allies and representatives would shit their pants if they had to have any actual social interaction with any of the people they're supposed to represent, unless they're doing it in some kind of patron-client relationship, like a criminal defense lawyer dealing with his clientele. And the aim is no longer a solidaristic world of equal people working and cooperating together. It's a world forever divided by impenetrable barriers that can never be bridged. They can only be policed and managed by the Ivy League manager class. And the replacement of the word equality by the word equity is part of the process of transformation from movements that threaten to change the system into movements that entrench the existing system. <laughs> So let's look at the words equity and equality. Just by looking at the words, you can see that they have the same root. They both come from the ancient Latin word equus, meaning even, plain, or just. So even in ancient Rome 2000 years ago, the concepts of justice and fairness were linked together with the concept of being even, i.e. equality, the level playing field. And the concepts of equality and fairness are deeply linked in our psyches, probably since our origins as a species, for reasons that we've explored a bit in earlier episodes. So equity inherently has within it a sort of implication of equality. Equity and equality are both vague words. But equity is much more vague because at least equality makes you ask, equality of what? Which can give you a very precise answer that you can decide to agree with or disagree with. So for the kids in the meme with the boxes in the baseball game, both captions in that meme demonstrate equality, but it's just equality of different things. On one caption, you have equality of the size of box, and on the other side, you have equality of ability to see the game. So if the authorities in charge of access to baseball games tells you that their goal is equality of box size, most people would say, well, that's stupid. What's the point of that? Isn't the point that everyone should be able to see the game? But if they say that they're aiming for equality of ability to see the game, then most people would say, great, that's fair, we support that. So equality is good or bad depending on equality of what. On the other hand, if the authorities instead tell us that their goal is equity in terms of ability to see the game, then that just means fairness. And that's a great lizard person word, because any normal person hearing that will just assume that it means everyone gets to see the game equally whereas the actual decision-making authority might have a very different idea of what constitutes fairness. <laughs>
Think of the types of authorities that invoke equity and who actually control access to baseball games in real life. It's actually very likely that the Department of Equitable Baseball Game Watching thinks that true fairness, true equity, is if you can't afford to go see the baseball game, then you shouldn't be able to see the baseball game at all. And nobody gets any crates. And they build an even higher fence so that no one can see anything no matter how many crates you stack. It's fair so long as everyone has an equal opportunity to pay full price for a ticket without being discriminated against by race or other identity criteria. And that's the lizard person beauty of a completely vague and ambiguous word like equity. And the more you identify with the authorities invoking equity, the more you'll trust them and the more you'll assume that they mean the same thing that you're imagining and the more they can screw you over. That's what politics is all about nowadays. The more vague a word is, the more power that the person using it is grabbing for themselves. And you can see examples of this principle wherever there is power. In law, for example, I am a practicing lawyer, and I specialize in defending tenants against landlords. And in every legal system, you have some laws, and particularly regulations, that are very precise, and other laws that are a lot more ambiguous. And the more ambiguous a law is, the more there's room for judges to fill in the blanks according to their own values or prejudices and ideas and life experiences. And since judges tend to overwhelmingly come from corporate or prosecutorial backgrounds, and where I live they're chosen by the governing political parties, they tend to think like people who work in corporations and in prosecutors' offices and in governing political parties, i.e. they think like the ruling class. So for example, where I practice, there's a law that says that you can't get evicted from your apartment for late payment unless your rent is 21 days late. But there's an exception. You can still get evicted if your rent is less than 21 days late if you pay your rent late frequently, but only if these frequent late payments cause your landlord, quote, serious injury. So the word frequently and serious injury are subject to interpretation by the housing tribunals. Now, any normal person reads the word serious injury and thinks that must be something big, like the landlord needs the rent on time in order to pay his mortgage or other important time-sensitive expenses. And that's certainly the way that I interpreted it when I read the law for the first time as a student working at a legal clinic. And I remember thinking, oh, I see. This is an exception that protects small landlords who own like a duplex that they live in, but when it comes to a big corporate landlord with lots of properties, you can basically pay up to 21 days late every month and you're still gonna be okay. But in law, like in most things, you never ever should assume that anything is logical or that it works according to your intuition or common sense or morality. So before giving the tenants any advice on this, I researched the case history of this law to make sure that the judges interpreted the law in the way that I interpreted it. And what I found really surprised me. When they first started to have these specialized housing courts here in the 1970s, serious injury meant having trouble with mortgage payments or other important time-sensitive expenses. This was an era when things like socialized health care and consumer protection laws and labor tribunals were introduced in Quebec and Canada, and when they were building subway systems and other public infrastructure projects. It was a time when wealthy countries around the world were able to tax corporations and the wealthy at high enough rates so that these states could afford to pay for all the nice things that make civilization worth living in. And in that era, government and the bureaucracy often saw themselves as defenders and protectors of the public. But over the years, as the era of big government got sucked down the toilet and replaced by the business-friendly neoliberal era, where the state is afraid to tax the rich, and public services and healthcare systems are all falling apart, and where politicians let the wolves run loose to eat all of the sheep, government is no longer seen as sexy. And the judges and bureaucrats today tend to think of themselves less as protectors of the people, and more as regular white-collar middle-class investors, homeowners, and landlords. So when you read recent cases about the 21-day rule, it's now considered serious injury if the building custodian has to go and ring your doorbell a couple of times during the month, even though the custodian gets a salary and this doesn't cost the landlord anything. And it's funny to see the reasoning of the judges in advancing this completely ridiculous interpretation of the term serious injury. When you read the cases where the judges start turning towards more landlord-friendly interpretations of this rule, you read judgments saying things like, well... Some judges say that serious injury means getting in trouble with a bank or not being able to pay expenses, 
But that can't be what the legislators meant when they wrote this law, because that would mean that the law would only protect small landlords. But tenants who have big corporate landlords could just pay their rent on the 20th of every month. That's not fair. So the legislators must have meant that serious injury is when the landlord is mildly annoyed because he has to email you three times, or when the superintendent had to knock on your door one time. After all, you can't have laws that apply differently to different groups of people. Ben no, ça se peut pas, là. And the interpretation is absolutely ridiculous on so many levels. It's just not true that all laws affect everyone equally. Laws against being allowed to sleep on a park bench don't affect billionaires and homeless people equally. They're entirely targeted at homeless people. Or progressive income taxes treat poor people quite differently than rich people. That's the whole point of them. And it's totally plausible that the people who wrote that legislation did in fact think that big landlords should be treated differently than small landlords, because the mentality of government at that time was to see itself as a protector of tenants and consumers and workers against the power of bosses and corporations and landlords. So laws that were originally written to protect tenants get filtered through the class of judges, and by means of the ambiguous words in the laws, the judges turn tenant protections into laws that facilitate evictions and gentrification. Because now the landlord can just pretend that you paid late a few times, and then you get kicked out so he can jack up the rent. Now, vague language is often just necessary in laws, because you can't predict every single situation that's going to come up. So there's always going to be room for the judge's discretion. But making precise language more vague on purpose when there's no reason for it or utility for it is basically just a power grab and a manipulation technique. And that's exactly what replacing equality by equity is. Imagine that you have a political candidate who runs on the platform of simplifying our complicated legal system, which is actually a great idea. And his proposal is, instead of having our confusing system with five zillion laws and regulations at multiple levels of government to cover every sort of situation imaginable, why don't we just get rid of all the laws and then have just one perfect common sense law that everyone can understand? It's a constitution that just says, Everyone must be excellent to each other, and all things must be cool and good. Like the combined wisdom of Bill and Ted movies and Orange Man memes. And that is the perfect law, if you're a total dictator. Because it means that the person who gets to make decisions, whether it's a judge, or the head of state, or the equity and inclusion officer, gets to decide whatever they want in any given situation without any constraints. A man shoots a homeless guy because the homeless guy smiled at his wife, the judge gives him a pass because the judge thinks that homeless people are scary and it's their own fault for being homeless, and that's not excellent. So the guy was just being excellent by defending his wife's honor. The president decides that the police can come search everyone's houses and execute everyone who's addicted to painkillers because being an addict isn't cool and making everyone safe from addicts is excellent. Vague rules mean whatever the person in charge says goes. And in our society, the people in charge who make decisions in most circumstances tend to be rich people, like business owners and investors and landlords, or else upper middle class people, like judges and politicians and managers and administrators, the skilled intellectual workers that rich people hire in order to make sure that their money keeps rolling in smoothly. So back to the word equity and how it's applied today. We live at a time when the middle class is getting more and more hollowed out each year, while the rich get richer and life is getting harder and harder for a lot of people. So there's a big market for lizard people politicians who can pretend to care about what people are going through and who will pretend to want to deliver change, but who in the end will just be delivering the same old bullshit as always, to keep the donors and the powerful people happy. So you get your Barack Obama running on hope and change which everyone thought meant hope for fundamental changes to the economy and politics, but what he actually just meant was change your underwear every day and keep hoping for a better life that's never going to come unless you win the lottery. Or you get your Donald Trump, who promises that everyone will get health care and that he'll protect American jobs, or he'll stop the opioid crisis, and he'll shake up the whole system. And in the end, he just delivers the same giant tax cuts for rich people that every president delivers, with the only change being that he ratcheted up ethnic conflict and made it okay to say things that had been considered beyond the pale in national politics for decades. And note that when Trump is promising that everyone gets health care, that's left-wing politics. In democracies, right-wing politicians basically only gain popularity by invoking tribal instincts or by promising left-wing policies which they never deliver, or both. <laughs> 
So you have Lizard Obama and Lizard Trump both making left-wing promises and then delivering right-wing results, but just in a different style. Trump does it in the conservative style with conservative words, and Obama does it in the liberal style with liberal words. And then you get all these little lizard people wannabes like Petey Buttigieg and Ron DeSantis's who are trying to be imitation Obamas and Trumps, but they just don't have any of that same lizard person charisma of being able to hypnotize people while you suck their blood out for your donors or for yourself in the case of Trump. So today, one big way that you can look like you're doing social change, but without threatening the power of rich people in any way, is instead of being a champion of the people as a whole, which makes elites super uncomfortable. Think of Bernie Sanders. Instead, you become a champion of some of the people, of historically disadvantaged people. But you don't champion them in a way that actually helps them. You do it in a way that looks like you're helping them, but you're mostly just helping rich people who donate to your university or to your political campaign. And how do you do that? What's the bizarro rich people version of helping minorities? It's called anti-racism and equity. You look at the difficulties faced by members of identity groups who are disproportionately poor, and you blame these difficulties entirely on discrimination without looking at the context of economic exploitation and competition which cause most of these problems, including generating and activating discrimination in the first place. And then you promise to deliver equity, an ambiguous verb which secretly means economic inequality disguised as social justice. If you look at history and anthropology, and you look at negative outgroup discrimination, things like racism and sexism, like why do those things exist in human beings all over the world? We're going to do an episode specifically about this in the future. But for now, in short, we evolve the tendencies to discriminate against people outside of our arbitrarily defined group in order to facilitate the economic exploitation of outside groups and to facilitate the exclusion of those groups from the competition for resources. One tribe makes a bunch of excuses to hate the other tribe so that we can take their resources and kill them or enslave them. Or men make a bunch of excuses so that they can basically enslave women in very patriarchal societies. Like the reason that anti-black racism came to become this giant system of oppression in the United States wasn't just because white people have evil racism in their hearts. It was in order to morally justify the economic exploitation of slaves. And dividing slavery from freedom by skin color was not just because of mysterious evil racism, but because it helped prevent broader opposition to slavery, meaning it prevented a coalition between whites and blacks, and prevented more people from identifying with the slave class. And then, after slavery, racism was consciously and explicitly used as a tool of the rich plantation owners and other business owners in order to stop the white and black workers from joining together to fight for better wages and working conditions. And that's exactly what was happening at the time the populist movement started becoming multiracial and expanding its popularity and power. All those Jim Crow laws were a reaction against that, and a successful one. And if you look at anthropology, and you look at societies that are extremely patriarchal, where women are second-class citizens who make all of the food but then only eat leftovers after the men and children have eaten, like we saw with the Lese in the episode on male domination. You can see that the attitudes and ideas of sexism and patriarchy serve the same purpose. It's a set of justifications to keep women as domestic servants, to reserve the best food for men and all the important positions of political and decision-making power. Studies going back to the 1970s show that if you take a bunch of strangers in a room and then you call half the people group A and then the other half group B, members of each group immediately begin to discriminate against each other and to infer bad motives into the behavior of the outgroup and good motives into the behavior of the members of their own group. And the most likely reason that this tendency evolved in human beings is to facilitate the exclusion and exploitation or sometimes even the genocide of other people in the competition for resources or else conversely to defend ourselves from other groups who are trying to do those things to us. And that's why I'm making a future episode called The Purpose of Identity Politics is Genocide, because it's true. There's a book called Dying of Whiteness by Jonathan Metzl. Metzl is a liberal type who went and did research on this idea that lower class Republicans vote against their own economic interests because of racism. In particular, he was interested in people with serious health problems, who were voting for state-level Republican candidates who were promising to reject expansions of the healthcare system that would literally save their lives. And the idea was supposed to be that these people are so racist and stupid that they'd rather die than give something to black people. 
hence the title of the book. But if you look at the language of the people that he's talking to, the racism that the author focuses on is real, but it's almost entirely preoccupied with economic concerns. The illegal immigrants are taking their jobs. The welfare cheats are taking their resources and bankrupting the country so that there's nothing left for honest taxpayers. It was so consistently about resource competition that in an interview with Coleman Hughes, Metzl defined racial resentment as, quote, In a nutshell, the fear that people are going to come take your stuff, that people are going to come cut in line in the push for resources, unquote. So what at first glance looks like knowingly voting against your economic interests because of racism is actually voting for what you think are your economic interests because of racism. You're sacrificing yourself for your group's economic interests, like you might lose out and even die from lack of health care, but you're punishing cheaters and line skippers, and that's going to help your children and your tribe in the long term. So we just cannot understand racism and other forms of discrimination without understanding the context of economic competition. Forms of outgroup discrimination like racism are messy proxies for economic competition which makes you see your economic interests along racial lines or other group identified lines instead of along class lines. And that's why it's such an effective tool to be used by elites, both conservative and liberal elites. In tribal times, identity probably was an effective match with economic interests. Like your chief maybe was richer than you, but had the same interests as you did when it came to having war with the opposing tribe. You guys were either going to get slaughtered or just lose out on this major economic competition, or you were all going to win together. But in complex civilizations, poor white people have much more in common in terms of their economic interests with poor black people than they have with rich white people or rich black people. Now imagine what racism would look like without conflict over resources or without economic competition. Like if we lived in a Star Trek world where no one was poor and everyone had fulfilling jobs that paid decently and everyone was entitled to a nice stable place to live and there was no economic inequality because replicators made everything that everyone needs. In a world like that, Racism would just mean that some people wouldn't be invited to the fun house parties of certain shitty other people who discriminate against them. And it would be super obnoxious, but it wouldn't be a huge political issue. The consequences just wouldn't be all that important. It would basically be the equivalent of some people being jerks or meanie weenies. And there are always jerks and meanie weenies in the world. It's when being a jerk or a meanie weenie systematically makes it harder for you to get a job or proper health care or a decent place to live or a cab or to participate in democracy or it gets you harassed by the police and sentenced more harshly by judges or it gets your health concerns dismissed by doctors. That's when it becomes important, when it involves resources. And today, in the real world, if you're a wealthy member of a non-dominant group in a country with equal legal rights for everyone, the wealthier that you get the more that the discrimination that you suffer from resembles people being meanie weenies, and the less it resembles a series of giant structural obstacles to you living a decent and dignified life. For working class and poor people, discrimination by bosses and landlords means that it's harder to get a job, and you're that much closer to homelessness, because poor people can't wait three months to get a job like middle class people can. And it means that it's much harder to find a decent place to live even when you have the skills or when you can afford the rent. Economic problems. And if you're a woman doing waitressing, you need to put up with sexual harassment all night because if you quit, you'll get evicted, lose your medical insurance, not be able to afford childcare, and you have no safety cushion to keep you alive while you find a place to work where you get harassed less. Economic problems. <laughs> Now, if you want a really clear illustration of the connection between economic inequality and racism, imagine a rich black person, Chris Rock. He parks his nice car in front of his big house in his rich neighborhood. And as he's going from his car to his front door, a police officer stops him and asks him what he's doing there. And Chris Rock is annoyed and he tells him that he's just going home to his own house. But the officer keeps grilling him and giving him a hard time, and he treats him with disrespect and hostility, until he finally is convinced that Chris actually lives there and that he isn't a drug dealer or a burglar. And then the cop maybe apologizes because he feels bad or because he realizes that Chris Rock is rich, and if he complains to the chief of police or the mayor, that the officer might get in trouble. <laughs> 
most of us would say that assuming that a black person is a drug dealer or a burglar is pretty racist. And it is. But why do people make these racist assumptions? Imagine that a week later, in the same neighborhood, a rich white person parks in front of his big rich house. But this rich white guy is dressed like a crusty punk. And the reason that he's rich is because he's from a famous crusty punk band, Anus Puss. And his name is Crack Rock. The same police officer who stopped Chris Rock stops Crack Rock and asks him the same questions and gives him the same hard time until he realizes that like black Chris Rock, white Crack Rock is just going to his legitimate big rich guy house. It might take this officer even longer to back off of Crack Rock than it did with Chris Rock because Chris Rock is dressed like a Gap ad and Crack Rock is dressed like a heroin addicted crusty punk and he kind of stinks and it's easier to imagine a rich black person than a rich crusty punk. The police guy assumes that the crusty punk guy is poor because his clothes are a cultural shortcut for poor person. Not every person who dresses like a crusty punk is poor, but most of them are. And despite being rich, crack rocks got discriminated against because his appearance is associated with poverty and danger, i.e. threat to property of the rich people in the rich neighborhood. In rich neighborhoods, poor people are usually gardeners or nannies or servants of some kind, or else they're there to do burglary. And in a society where black people are disproportionately poor, black skin is also a shortcut for poverty and danger, especially to police who deal with violent crime mostly in poor neighborhoods, where they disproportionately see black and brown skin. And the perception of danger like economic competition, triggers the human innate tendency to discriminate. So even black cops will tend to make the same assumptions and have similar attitudes. The police officer sees a lot of dangerous criminals with black faces, and then he starts to see black faces as dangerous, as his outgroup discrimination instinct gets activated. And it'll be even worse if he was raised to be racist. And of course there's a huge amount of racism that people grew up with that's part of our culture, as a legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. And that has huge effects on how we treat each other. But imagine that you can make all of that go away by giving everyone magical brown pills. Poof! Overnight. No more stereotypes. No more racism in people's hearts and minds. No more discrimination in courts or by police or doctors or landlords or employers. Unless you do something about poverty and economic inequality in general, all of that racial discrimination would just creep right back in again in a generation or so. Because even if racist attitudes and ideas are gone from people's hearts and minds, black and brown people would still be disproportionately poor for historical reasons. Slavery, Jim Crow, deindustrialization. And that means that over time, police and judges and landlords and employers, who already routinely discriminate against poor people of any race for economic reasons, they'll start discriminating against black people in general because they'll start associating poverty and the crime and dysfunction associated with it with black faces and language and culture. That is the unfortunate shortcut that our minds are evolved to take. In Appalachian towns, where there are very few minorities, you go to the trailer park and the police will treat the poor white people there just like they treat the poor brown people in New York or Atlanta. You get the same contempt and the perception of threat the same set of emotional responses and intuitions that are operating when racism is at play. You just get different epithets, tweaker trailer trash instead of thug and n One is called racism and one is called classism, but they're both the same human outgroup discrimination response, and they're both based on the perception of poverty and danger and hatred of weakness. Chris Rock looks like a Gap ad but the police stop him because black skin triggers a discrimination impulse that goes beyond economic inequality, but that is basically a spillover effect of economic inequality. Chris Rock is paying the price for the fact that black people are disproportionately poor for historical reasons, but it's the poverty that's ultimately causing that response and the association of black skin with poverty, not some mysterious inherent feature of black skin or of white people's inner evil. Racism is a weed that has its own life beyond poverty and beyond economic inequality, but poverty, economic inequality, exploitation, and resource competition are the soil from which racism and other forms of discrimination sprout. There isn't really much need for it otherwise. Now, most people understand that poverty is a bad thing that ideally should not exist. 
Like, a common sense idea that I bet most people have is that in a society that's getting richer and richer on average, everyone should be benefiting from that, and poverty should be on its way out the door. But that's not the world that we live in, and those aren't the values of our ruling business and government elites. People in ruling class bizarro land might not like poverty in theory, but they actually need poverty in reality. Not all rich people. Doctors and basketball players don't need poverty to be rich. But people who get their wealth from businesses that depend on low-wage employees do need poverty to be rich. If you don't have poor people in the world, then no one would work at Amazon warehouses where you get fired for having poo-poos that take too long to come out, and no one would work at life-threatening cobalt mines in Congo for pennies a day to make your iPhones. These companies would have to pay serious wages to get people to do this dangerous or otherwise awful work. Or else they would have to make the working conditions much better, which is much more expensive. And the wages would have to reflect how onerous or dangerous the work is, instead of just reflecting the bargaining power of the employee. In other words, a world without poverty would evaporate almost all of the profits of the owners and shareholders of these companies. So if you're someone whose wealth comes from a business that benefits from low wages, either as an owner, investor, or high-level executive, you want there to be enough people that have enough money to buy your products and services. But you also want a sizable amount of poverty and inequality, so you can get your labor for cheap. And also so you can scare your middle class and upper middle class skilled employees out of getting too uppity and out of asking for too much in terms of their wages or benefits, because there's a place for them to fall down to. So the entire corporate class and investor class, who are the same people who donate to politicians and to universities, this is the direction that their instincts will tend to lie in. They're afraid of poverty disappearing. So what's a bizarro, wealth-friendly way of doing social justice for minorities that doesn't threaten to eliminate poverty? Well, you make it your paid life's work to ensure that poverty and wealth are racially proportionate to society as a whole, without even thinking about changing the actual amount of poverty and wealth in the society. Again, Ibram X. Kendi, guru of this type of mentality, and author of the appropriately titled Anti-Racist Baby, tells us that something is racist if it doesn't result in all the levels of hierarchy in society having the exact same racial proportions as in the general public. And if something is not perfectly proportional, then you need to take concrete action to make it proportional. And you can't be passive. You're either racist or anti-racist. You're either tolerating racial disproportionality or working for racial proportionality. And you're not doing anything or even thinking about the fact that poverty exists in the first place. This sounds radical and badass. What it actually means is that the problem with billionaires and CEOs and giant corporations isn't that they make so much money that it allows them to completely dominate our government and they rewrite our laws to make themselves richer at the expense of everyone else. The real problem is that not enough of the people who completely dominate our government and write the laws to make themselves richer at the expense of everyone else are female or black. And the problem with poverty isn't that it exists or that it's immoral. The problem is that black people make up 25% of the poor population instead of their 15% of the general population. So the solution to that is we need more white poor people and more Asian poor people and more Jewish poor people to make it all correctly proportional. Now that's utopia. Great job. Like imagine if in slavery times, the abolitionists, instead of making all of their powerful calls for human equality against the moral abomination of slavery, which must be abolished, imagine if instead they were anti-racist activists, quote unquote, and they were arguing that slavery is unfair because it's racially unequal. We need white slaves and Chinese slaves and Jewish slaves, and we need black slave owners. And once 15% of the slave owners are black, and 50% are female, and 60% of the slaves are white, then slavery will be equitable, and we can all go home. This is what all of these anti-racist equity people are actually advocating for when it comes to poverty and extreme wealth in our society. And this ridiculous approach to social justice has multiple benefits for the donor class and the upper middle classes. First, even though you're actually just reinforcing economic equality, you feel like you're doing something good for society. Second, it's good PR for rich, powerful corporations and institutions to show their customers and the frustrated masses that they're doing something nice for society.
So Nike is enslaving poor workers in Asia to make their stupid overpriced sneakers for poor people in the U.S. to buy, but then they'd support Colin Kaepernick protesting against police racism. And now they're the good guys. Third, focusing entirely on racial proportions and ignoring economic exploitation triggers that tribal impulse in our brains which keeps people divided by race and by every other zillion identity tribes. And this prevents us from forming the larger coalitions that we need in order to fight for things like universal health care or free education. It makes us identify with the rich, powerful people in our own tribe instead of with the poor people in the other tribes. In the Jim Crow era, the division was extreme. There was a legal system in place that explicitly maintained an apartheid-type system of two classes of citizens, white and black and racism and racial animosity were promoted in order to keep that system stable and to justify it. And all of that prevented working class whites and blacks from joining together to fight for better conditions for everyone. But you can get similar, though much less extreme effects, by giving some small advantages to historically oppressed people in a way that makes other struggling working class people feel like they're being disadvantaged. And then you let the right-wing political parties and media fan the flames of resentment and spread the idea that white people's resources are being taken away and given to minorities. And then you can call the poor and white working class people who are responding to these messages, you can call them racist. And thereby you are furthering divisions and tribalism. And all the while, the elements of economic competition underlying all of this and the commonalities of struggle that would actually unite poor and working class, white and black and other people, all of that gets forgotten. And it's not Jim Crow, but it's good for business and bad for unionizing. And that's actually one of the classic tactics of colonialism, in particular French colonialism. The French would go into a country and find an oppressed minority group and give them legal equality and full rights and give them education, and then they'd start to give them positions of power and administration in the colonial government, often under the guise of righting past wrongs. Like, when we go into Afghanistan, it's never about control over oil pipelines, it's always to save the women. And then the majority, who is already racist against this minority, would become ten times more racist, which would make that new ruling minority completely dependent on France for safety, so that they'd never betray their masters. And boom, divide and rule. Again, colonialism is much more extreme than white fragility and stupid memos about how being on time is white supremacy culture. But that stuff is on the very mild side of the same spectrum of tactics for divide and rule. Stefan Hamel pointed out on the This Is Revolution podcast that one of the ways that anti-union consultants teach business owners to break strikes and labor organizing drives is by advising them to institute some kind of anti-racist policy on the shop floor or to give some privilege or advantage to some workers but not others. And this breaks the solidarity of the workers because it triggers their tribal instincts and resentments. And they start fighting among themselves about whether these special advantages or policies are fair or not. And then they redivide on racial lines instead of on workers versus owners lines. And if you look at the sort of anti-racist trainings that are popular today, especially the Robin D'Angelo white fragility stuff, you can see that while it presents itself as helping us become more sensitive to each other, what it actually does is it just trains employees to be terrified of one another. Instead of focusing on empathy, consideration for others, camaraderie, common goals, and common humanity, it focuses on guilt and shame for the original sin of whiteness, and it has you narcissistically constantly focusing on yourself and your own endless, incurable evil. And it should come as no surprise that they've done studies that found that employees tend to become more racist after these stupid trainings. First of all, the more that you remind people that they're white, the more they start to think of white as their in-group and everyone else as the out-group. And as I talked about, people naturally discriminate against out-groups, however arbitrarily they're defined. And especially if your message is, your group is bad, your group is bad, your group is the origin of all evil, unless you have no self-respect, which is very common in the corporate world and the elite world, you're going to end up rejecting the whole framework, and you're probably going to start rallying to your white tribe to defend yourselves from the other tribes attacking you. That's how our shitty instincts work. And it's not a coincidence that white nationalism has been on the rise in the US and Europe at the same time as all this garbage has been popular in mainstream liberal culture. Now, a lot of educated liberal types love punishment and guilt and self-deprivation. So they like being told that they're bad and evil. It's like BDSM for rich people. But even then, these trainings are basically conditioning you so that if you're white, 
and a brown person walks in the room, your cortisol shoots up and you immediately feel stressed out and scared that you're going to do something wrong. Oh, I like your hair. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm racist. I'm bad. I said I like your hair. So these trainings are conditioning you to have negative reactions to brown people, i.e. racism. And if you're brown and you're watching white people have a heart attack each time you go near them, that's not exactly conducive to an environment where you're going to feel like you're at home. But while all of this is a disaster in terms of fighting racism, it's not so bad from the point of view of big corporate employers. Because if employees are uncomfortable around each other and they're divided along racial or gender lines, then they're a lot less likely to band together to demand better wages and working conditions. Divide and conquer is a natural instinct for people in power. It reminds me of a case I had where the landlord was trying to get all the tenants out of the building so she could sell it at a higher price. And she kept meeting with the tenants individually to tell them lies and to pressure them to sign contracts and to leave, which is a classic tactic. But then, when I got the tenants to start talking to each other, and when she found out about it, she started flipping out and was yelling at them, You're not allowed to talk to your neighbors! As if she owned them and not just the building. People who are trying to exploit you always want to keep you divided. And they get very nervous when you get too friendly with each other. It is a deep instinct. There's a stupid liberal school where the black parents started suing the school because they were segregating the kids by race, supposedly for anti-racist reasons. Another advantage of the rainbow of inequality strategy is that by focusing on the symptoms, discrimination, instead of on the main cause, economic inequality and exploitation, you have a disease that has no cure, so that there's always a need for your heroic efforts. You can never stop doing the work. You need to keep hiring Robin D'Angelo over and over again to berate you and make you feel guilty for being alive. Ibram Kendi proposes a United States Government Federal Department of Anti-Racism, which would evaluate every single policy to see if it advances what he calls anti-racism, which for him just means racial proportionality. And you can imagine this army of upper-middle-class Ivy League college graduates making sure that every single aspect of society has the exact numbers of every single religion, race, gender, disability. Making sure that your crusty punk show isn't just white crusty punks. That you have to go kidnap some black kids and raise them in your crusty punk commune to make sure that you have the right race metrics. And this is awesome from the point of view of the Harvard crowd, because that strategy will never fix racism in any meaningful way, and it'll therefore just keep those people in jobs forever. When you read liberal theorists who write about race, even thoughtful, interesting writers who make valuable contributions, like Ta-Nehisi Coates or people involved with the 1619 Project, you can see that they just think that racism is a mysterious force that has no cause and no solution, and that will never be resolved in any significant way. And that's what you get when you don't connect racism to the economic factors that generate it, and you have no theory of evolution of various human tendencies. A fifth reason why having a proportional rainbow ruling class is appealing to Ivy universities and corporations is that it provides legitimacy to a ruling class that has been pulling the rug out from under the middle and working classes of all races and genders for decades now. Again, think of colonialism. After Julius Caesar took over big chunks of Western Europe where Asterix and Obelix live, and he started taking tribute from those regions, he scandalized the traditional Roman elites by letting the elites of the Gauls and Celts and various other Western tribes into the Roman Senate. And he did that in order to gain their loyalty. And the Tucker Carlsons of his day, like Cicero and Cato, ranted and raged about it. It's just easier to control a society when people feel represented. If poor brown people see rich brown faces in important positions of power and influence, they feel represented even when those elites are screwing them over left and right. Barack Obama set black home ownership and wealth back by a whole generation in the aftermath of the housing crash in 2008 when he bailed out the banks instead of the people. Leading up to the market crash, banks targeted black people for all of these crazy exploding mortgages because they knew that black Americans tend not to have experience buying homes, even when they make solid incomes because most people nowadays have to inherit their homes and their down payments from their parents, and black people's grandparents were living in Jim Crow, so they never got to accumulate that capital in the first place. And then when the housing crash came, Barack Obama bailed out the banks instead of the people, and that just wiped out black home ownership. First slavery, then Jim Crow, then deindustrialization, then Obama lets the people lose all of their homes. Now, of course, there's nothing special about Obama. He wasn't worse to black people than anyone else. Any other white president would have probably done the same thing. But 
Black people might have blamed the white person, but Obama is still adored by and large by black Americans because he looks like one of them, and because they understood that Republicans were fanning racist flames in opposition to him, which made them targets as well, so they rallied to his side. The liberal and conservative sides kind of work together in symbiosis to keep people divided, to keep people looking up to the rich people of their own tribe instead of looking towards the same class of people in the opposite tribe. The Soviet Union was also very interested in trying to have lots of national and ethnic representation in important positions in the Communist Party. If you're not actually going to give the bulk of the population any real influence over anything, you can still placate them and make them feel invested in the system by making them feel represented and emotionally identified with your enterprise, with your party. China today has nine political parties, but none of them have any real power besides the Communist Party. The idea is to get various constituencies invested into the system and to take their temperature in various ways, like the Estates General in monarchical France. And right-wing dictatorships do the same thing, but without the multiculturalism. They get you emotionally invested in the ruling power, the idea of the nation. The idea behind fascism was that Hitler and Mussolini and other great leaders were supposed to be the ultimate representation of the German or Italian people in some magical, mystical, symbolic way. It's the same strategy, but relying on the support of the cultural majority instead of a multicultural coalition. And corporations also have a lot of similar propaganda activities for their employees to get you to feel identified with the corporation in various ways. So let's look at some examples of how this stuff actually plays out. One of the big areas where this concept of equity has become a reality is in college admissions where there are now entire diversity, equity, and inclusion departments whose responsibilities include diversifying the student body to make admissions more equitable, meaning more fair. Well, what does fairness in university admissions look like to the people who administer the universities? A normal person would think, well, poor people have a lot of obstacles to get into top schools, so maybe they should get preferential admissions. For example, in the United States, poor neighborhoods tend to have bad schools because schools are funded by municipal taxes. And it's also harder for parents who've never been to university to know how to prepare their children for it. And also, life tends to be a lot more chaotic in poverty and less conductive to learning in the first place. Robin J. Hayes, a black filmmaker and assistant professor at various universities who grew up poor and graduated from Yale, points out that, quote, By the time I applied to Yale, I had been groomed as a scholarship student in majority affluent feeder schools to succeed in conditions that guaranteed healthy GPAs. My attentive teachers in small classes delivered a curriculum that emphasized critical thinking skills, leadership capacity, and participation in mainstream institutions. Athletics and creative activities, studying in well-resourced libraries, and sessions with a seasoned, well-connected college counselor were all required of me. Unsurprisingly, these nurturing environments allowed me to gain the credentials elite universities require. No other kid from my block in East Flatbush was so lucky. At their truly public schools, not charters, not magnets, but common schools available to every family in the neighborhood, they routinely face atrocious conditions, including gun violence, overcrowding, and a curriculum that emphasized obedience over innovation. As outsiders to the college prep feeder system, the students who persevere and manage to graduate are rarely seen as high achieving by schools like Yale. From the perspective of prep schoolers who have no grasp of the challenges presented by economic scarcity, the collegiate honor roll lacrosse captain easily surpasses the Benjamin Banneker High B plus student who lives in a shelter and works at Target after school to help out her single mother and younger siblings. The fantasy that all young people are running the same race blinds many university trustees, administrators, and admissions committees to the reality that they undervalue students who always have to run uphill. Unquote. So, wealth brings enormous advantage, and one of the main determinants of your wealth is whether or not you inherited it from your parents. Like the wealthiest people in England today are still descendants of the original Norman invaders who were the ruling class as of 1066. A thousand fucking years ago. Once you have a certain amount of money, you have to be not only a complete idiot, but also a complete maniac with a gambling addiction in order to lose it. You hire people to invest it for you, and it just keeps attracting more and more money like a black hole. It's called the Matthew Effect.
All of this gets passed down from generation to generation, especially homes like we just talked about. But some people's ancestors didn't have anything to pass down to them. Black Americans, for example, weren't even allowed to own property until 1860. And then they had a zillion legal obstacles in their way until the 1960s. And then, when they gained their full equal rights and began climbing up the ladder into the middle class via unionized manufacturing jobs, swoosh, those jobs started getting shipped off to Mexico and China because of policies agreed on by both liberal and conservative parties alike. So the rug was pulled out from black Americans just when they started being able to accumulate wealth. The expression, brother can't catch a break, is not a joke. And of course, this affected all working class Americans. Like, look at the epidemic of opioid addiction plummeting life expectancy in the Rust Belt gummo apocalypse. But black people as a whole are worse off because as a whole they were excluded by law until the 1960s, and because the obstacles to their accumulating wealth were lifted so recently. The wealth of most middle class people is just their homes, and that's what gets passed down from generation to generation. So black families headed by a person that graduated from college today have less wealth than white families headed by someone who dropped out of high school because those black families tend not to have inherited property while the white families tend to have inherited property. These factors all stack the odds against black Americans building up the capital and skills that give people the advantages that they need to compete in today's college rat race. And that's not just because poor neighborhoods have badly funded schools or because poor families usually have a hard time training their kids for university. It's also because the fancy Ivy League schools today have completely insane admissions criteria that almost require you to be rich to get in. Not only do you need stellar grades, but you also need to have started an NGO to save the Chinese whales when you were three years old. And you have to have invented a new source of clean nuclear energy for sub-Saharan African orphans when you were nine years old. And half the time, these are achievements that the parents of rich kids hire someone else to set up for their kid, specifically so they can get into college 15 years later. And every person who's poor got to their poverty by a different route. But black people were excluded as a group, and as a result, on average, even black professionals are way behind on the accumulation game in terms of owning wealth. So to make competition for university admissions truly equitable and fair, which liberals say that they want, and to create true equality of opportunity that the conservatives say that they want, you'd need massive wealth redistribution, and you'd need to get rid of or equalize inheritances, and you'd need to get rid of school funding according to zip code. Well, these are all things that are beyond the powers of universities to do. So what can they do? Well, you'd think that maybe they would favor American descendants of slaves, especially from poor backgrounds. Or maybe they just favor poor people of all colors, who have almost all of the same obstacles as descendants of slaves do, but who just got to their poverty via a variety of different routes. Or maybe the universities can stop requiring that you have to have invented Microsoft Windows while you were wearing diapers to qualify. Or maybe they can get rid of legacy admissions, where they let in all of these unqualified booger-eating Billy Madisons like George W. Bush or Hunter Biden or Donald Trump and Donald Trump Jr. because their dads were big donors. But of course, they don't do any of that. Instead, what they do do <laughs> is they give preference to rich and upper middle class black students. Not only are the black kids who get admitted to Harvard overwhelmingly upper middle class and wealthy, just like all of the other white students and other students at Harvard, but a big chunk of them aren't even descended from slaves at all. So by 2018, Harvard was proud to have finally achieved racial proportionality when it came to black students. 15% of the Harvard freshmen are now black, just like in the general population. Except, 41% of these black freshmen are African and Caribbean immigrants, people from Nigeria and Ghana who are not descendants from slaves at all, or people from Jamaica and the Caribbean whose ancestors were slaves, but who didn't have the same subsequent 100 years of post-emancipation obstacles as they did in the United States. And most of these immigrants who end up at Harvard were already wealthy or middle class when they got to the U.S. in the first place. And they got here usually on special visas for skilled workers. So black freshmen tend to be from the same economic class as all the other kids. And Harvard has as many students come from the top 1% of the income distribution as the bottom 60%. More come from the top 10% by income than the bottom 90%. Walter Ben Michaels points out that, quote, when students and faculty activists struggle for cultural diversity, they are in large part battling over what skin color the rich kids have. Unquote. 
and Pascal Robert from the This Is Revolution podcast scoffs that a typical example of the Ivy League mentality towards solving problems of racial inequality in the United States is a discussion sponsored by the African American Alumni Association of the Harvard Business School, which was non-ironically titled Bridging the Racial Wealth Gap by Serving on Federal Reserve Boards. Now, at the same time as Harvard's admissions people are trying really hard to have more black faces on campus, they're also putting in a lot of effort to have a lot less Chinese and Indian and Pakistani faces on campus. People from Asia make up about 6% of the United States population, and they're 19% of the student body of Harvard. But they'd be 43% of the student body if admissions were just based on grades and extracurricular activities alone, including inventing warp drives for animal shelters. So Harvard specifically invented these vague personality score criteria for their admissions process so that they can make excuses to stop the Asiatic hordes while letting in more rich Nigerians and rich white kids. And this personality score is more heavily weighted than any other criteria, including academic performance. So the vaguest criteria has the most power, verbs, equity. It's a lot like the anti-Jewish quotas that these universities had in place until the 1960s, which incidentally rejected working class and poor Jews and selected mostly wealthy and upper middle class Jewish students who would fit in better with the Ivy League elite culture. Now to a normal person, whether you think that top universities should be producing the best scholars and doctors and lawyers for the benefit of society, or if you think that these schools have a responsibility to make society a more fair place in so far as they can, the actual admissions criteria are completely ridiculous. Instead of making society more fair, it just completely paints over the fact that you need all these special advantages that come with social class to get into these schools in the first place. It's not fair according to conservative performance criteria, and it's not fair in the sense of correcting unfair advantages. It's just creating a proportional rainbow of rich kids. Naturally, these admissions policies fuel ethnic conflict along identity politics lines. American descendants of slaves at Harvard demand that immigrant blacks and Asians and white women be excluded from privileged admissions criteria. Asian students sue the schools for discriminating against them. Meanwhile, rants aimed at downwardly mobile white people about how deserving white students are being denied the opportunity to climb the social ladder in favor of non-deserving brown and beige students has been a staple of right-wing demagoguery for decades now. Now, on the left, people concerned with equality of power, critics have argued that the way that you help disadvantaged people and the way that you end racial inequalities is to target economic inequalities, which will disproportionately help black people and other historically oppressed minorities without inciting a race war. And the reaction of those elite schools to those critiques is quite telling. In 2018, Richard Collenberg from the Progressive Policy Institute submitted a set of proposals for class-based admissions criteria that would increase the amount of black and disadvantaged minority students without having any racial criteria at all, nor any racist personality criteria. His proposals would scrap Billy Madison legacy admissions, and it would scrap the show pony achievements that only rich kids can accomplish when their parents pay Bill Gates to invent a cure for cat AIDS for their kid. And instead, the proposed criteria would focus on grades and academic achievements, while favoring people from working class backgrounds. And because the useless Billy Madison kids would be gone, and quotas against Asians would be gone, it would balance out the lower performance of the poorer kids and the academic scores of the student body as a whole would only go down by 0.8%. Of course, Harvard rejected all of these proposals, on the grounds that 0.8% would dilute Harvard's reputation for academic excellence. But Harvard already lowers its averages by more than that by preventing all of those Asian students from getting in, and by letting in Donald Trump Jr.'s and Hunter Biden's and Billy Madison's. Heather McDonald, writing for the right-wing New Criterion, tells us that in its defense against the lawsuit by Asian students, quote, Harvard invoked a parade of horribles that would ensue if racial preferences were ever held to be illegal. If that day ever comes, the university warned ominously, the court would send the message and create the reality that America's universities are no longer its cradles of opportunity and its beacons of social mobility, unquote. So, according to Harvard, social mobility is when Hunter Biden and George W. Bush and Billy Madison get in despite being crackheads because their dads are rich and powerful, and when poor kids who work against huge obstacles to get in don't get in because they're poor. <laughs>
And if you pay attention to what these universities do versus what they say, which is a great way to detect lizard people, the real goal is clearly not academic excellence or social justice or fairness or righting past wrongs. It's just having a ruling class that's a racially proportional rainbow of rich kids. And the Ivy Leagues truly do produce the ruling class of the United States and of the world. Not only does a place like Harvard produce all of the judges on the U.S. Supreme Court and most of the presidents and a huge proportion of the CEOs and directors of big companies, but it also produces so many of the people at the head of everything everywhere. For example, my friend who works as a teacher and sometimes administrator in the New York City school system, he tells me that whenever there are important administrative positions open, if someone like him with 25 years of experience is ever competing for a job with a 22-year-old Harvard grad with no experience, they automatically give it to the Harvard kid. So, to do a little recap, you have two different strategies that use our tribal, innate, collective identity discrimination responses in order to divide us so that we never join up on common economic interests. You have one strategy which targets people who have conservative dispositions and it focuses on outside groups as threats to the resources of the inside group. Immigrants taking jobs, welfare cheats draining our taxes, woke elites sending our jobs to Mexico and China, etc. And this prevents people from identifying common struggles like how deindustrialization in the U.S. wiped out working-class black wealth and white wealth, and how this was the result of policies of liberal and conservative parties working together for the donor class. Or how all corporations send jobs to China, whether they fly American flags or rainbow flags. Or how immigrants flood into the country because the same free trade policies that deindustrialized the United States also threw millions of people off of their farms in Mexico and in Latin America and Haiti so they come to the U.S. in droves to survive. They're on the same side as we are. And then you have a strategy which targets people with liberal dispositions, which turns all of the economic injustices of the world into racial and gender injustices, divorced from the economic context which generates those injustices. So instead of saying that our economic system increasingly puts a million obstacles in the way of people of all races to get education and to get capital, and that black people are poorer on average because they're behind in the accumulation game for historical reasons. Instead of that, we say that black people are poorer on average because of evil, mysterious racism, which generates inequitable outcomes. And we blame all of the obstacles on racism and ignore the fact that most of those same obstacles affect poor people of all ethnic groups. And the solution to that problem is that you give more power to the powerful. You add on a whole bureaucracy of Ivy League educated race managers in government universities and corporations, whose impossible task it will be to make sure that the unfair outcomes that our economic system naturally generates will be redistributed according to racial and gender proportions, which will somehow make poverty and homelessness and death by lack of health care insurance fair. And when the liberals try to fix racism with guilt trip trainings and cancel mobs and harebrained racial redistribution schemes and personality tests, this activates white identity as a threat response. And then the right-wing media and politician ecosystem starts jizzing on overdrive and turns around and says, look at how these liberal elites and minorities are threatening your resources, your jobs, your access to education. And by pointing at minorities and supposedly woke corporations, they can conveniently ignore all of the other corporations and all of the right-wing legislators who are stealing all of your resources and sending your jobs to China and every other low-wage country and who've been allowing the cost of education to explode for decades now. And when the right-wing gets more racist and more white nationalist, the liberals start joining in the jizz fest because now they can point to all the racist and sexist messaging, which means that they can ignore all the economic concerns underlying the fears of a lot of the people who respond to those messages. And then they can dismiss anyone who responds to those messages as bigots and deplorables that you must never find any common economic interest with unless you too are a racist bigot. And then they get to present themselves as protectors of the vulnerable minorities in an increasingly hostile environment that is very real and very threatening for real. It's the perfect two-step boogaloo bounce ruling class shuffle jamboree that keeps everyone obsessed with instinctively divisive cultural messaging and keeps our eyes off of our common economic problems and our common goals and our common shared humanity. <laughs> 
But if we know how discrimination works and what it's evolved for, and we know what lizard people look like, and we can identify these liberal and conservative methods to divide and conquer us, we can become immune to all of this stupid hysterical messaging, and we can start to connect with each other and find our common economic interests. And in doing so, we'll find our common humanity. And that's how you fight discrimination in all of its forms in the first place. Okay, so I had written a whole section of this episode that looked at Kimberly Crenshaw's famous article where she introduces the concept of intersectionality, and I re-injected the idea of class into that article because that article completely ignores class, and I show you like, what astonishing things happen when you do that. But this episode is already insanely long, so I think I'm going to put that out as a separate, shorter bonus episode, which, like everything I do, will be free for everyone. Speaking of which... Give me some money. It usually takes several weeks to several months full time to make these episodes with the research, writing, and then video editing. And during all the time that I'm doing these episodes, I'm either working at the same time, but like just enough to survive, or else I'm not working at all and not making any money, and then I have to make it up afterwards, and it makes me take a giant hit to my income. And like I mentioned in the video, I'm a lawyer for tenants but my annual income is almost exactly the same as what a full-time minimum wage worker makes in Canada because I make these videos. Though I became a lawyer exactly so that I could work part-time and could afford to support projects like this. But holy crap, this is a lot of fucking work. There are options in the show notes to do per episode donations or one-time donations or monthly donations if you don't mind the fact that sometimes it takes me three months to put out an episode either because the episodes are so complicated or I have to take a break from doing this so that I can work. And speaking of minimum wage, there are a few people who gave me some really huge ass donations last time and I won't mention their names because I don't want them to get big egos, but I really, really appreciate it. It means so much to me that people care about what I'm doing enough to take the time to sign up and send me money. And it helps me do basic things like get a mattress that I've needed to get for ages. And if you don't have money to spare, do not feel bad. There are a ton of things that I can't support because I can't afford it either. That's why I don't monetize my channel, even though I'm eligible for it, because I don't want to gunk up your life with more stupid advertisements than you're already subjected to. And I don't do any paywall content at all, because that defeats the whole purpose of doing a show that's geared at spreading knowledge and skills. So your subscriptions and donations are not purchasing any commodities, they are solidarity payments. Because you're someone who can afford it, and you want the show to keep going, and you want me to keep going. And as always, there's a bibliography and transcript linked in the show notes. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can hear the audio podcast version on your podcast apps. And if you're listening on podcasts, check out the YouTubes, which have a lot of fun pictures and memes and videos of my punim. And there's someone who's been making Spanish subtitles to the videos and someone who's making Turkish subtitles. And I think they're already out for the first couple of episodes. So check out those. Unless you're Armenian, you won't want to see the Turkish episodes. And if you like the music on the podcast, I make all the music and I'm putting together an album right now. So check out my stuff that you can download for free at star69, all one word, dot bandcamp dot com. And please like and subscribe and also review this show on Urple Music. It helps the show pop up more readily on searches. And contact me with any corrections or suggestions or comments at worldwidescroats at gmail.com or comment on the YouTubes. And until next time, see ya!